Good morning, everyone. Um, you're very welcome to this morning's webinar discussion on the, Euro on the Euro Europe and the global economy as part of the IIEA's 30th anniversary celebrations. My name is Frances Rouen, and I'm delighted to be chairing this session this morning with two very distinguished speakers, Pascal Donoghue, Ireland's Minister for Finance and President of the Eurogroup, and Professor Philip Lane, who's a member of the Executive Board of the European Central Bank and its Chief Economist. You'll see that they're together in the same picture. They're joining us from the Irish Embassy in Lisbon, where they're uh, there for an in-person meeting of the uh, in-person Eurogroup Summit, uh, which was scheduled since this date was, was um, confirmed. So in this world of webinars, it's possible to continue with the plan we have, despite a change of, of, of schedule for them. Uh, and obviously, there's some silver linings in the, in the, in the, in the world of, of, um, uh, of, of pandemics and what we've learned how to deal with distance. So let me just briefly outline the format for this morning's session. Uh, I'm beginning, I'll begin by putting an opening question to each of the speakers, and they'll have approximately five minutes to uh, so to share their responses on that. I'll pick up uh, from that discussion at, on certain points, and we'll explore them a little bit further. So please send in your questions throughout the session as they occur to you, and we'll introduce them as we go along. We'll have about 20 to 25 minutes or so at the end dedicated to a just audience discussion. So if you have a question, submit it in writing under the Zoom's Q&A function, and we'll ask that you identify yourself and your organization if, if, you, if there's one with which they're associated, and to try to keep in mind, to keep the questions as always for the IIEA as brief as possible so that we can deal with as many questions as possible. Um, and a reminder that the discussion today is fully on the record, so it's not Chatham House rules, uh, so just note that. And if you want to get involved in the discussion on Twitter, we encourage you to use the hashtag hashtag IIEA30. So let me briefly introduce our speakers who are known to most of you, but in this globalized world, not to all of you. Um, Pascal Donoghue, TD, is Minister for Finance of Ireland, a position he's held since June 2020, and he's currently president of the Eurogroup. Minister Donoghue served as Minister for Finance and Public Expenditure and Reform from 2016 to 2020. And before that, he was Minister for Transport, Tourism and Sport, and Minister of State for European Affairs. He was elected a, a, a TD for Dublin Central in February 2011, and prior to that, he was a member of Shanna from 20, 2007 to 2011. So Philip Lane has been Chief Economist and member of the, Europe, of the Executive Board of the European Central Bank since June 2019. Prior to this appointment, he was Governor of the Central Bank of Ireland from 2015 to 2019. He served as Whateley Professor of Political Economy at Trinity College Dublin from 2012 to 2019 and had lectured at the university from 1997. He received his PhD in economics from Harvard University in 1995 and was Assistant Professor of Economics and International Affairs at Columbia University between 1995 and 1997. So for those of you who didn't know them beforehand, these are the key, key things that, that you'd be interested to hear about them. So before to um, turn to the questions, I would like to, at this moment just to thank the IIEA for inviting me to uh, be here this morning, given this opportunity to be, to be in the company of two former students of the Department of Economics of Trinity College, and for make, who have made such significant contributions both to Ireland and to the European Union, and they continue to do so. So my opening question, and let me put this first to the, uh, to the minister, uh, it's an easy one, your starter for 10 as it were, um, what would you see as the three key milestones in the development of the European economy over the last 30 years since the IIEA was established? Well, uh, uh, good morning, Francis, and thank you very much for the opportunity to participate in this seminar. I just want to acknowledge the 30 years of uh, fantastic contribution that the IIEA has made to debate about Europe and to debate indeed about Ireland's place in the world. And of course, at an event like this, I'm always very conscious of the contribution that uh, Brendan Halligan made through the IIEA and beyond uh, to our country and to our role within Europe and indeed to our support for Europe. And I thought the recent event and uh, indeed uh, celebration of his life that you organized with the essay competition, uh, I thought was a very fitting recognition of Brendan's contribution to our civic and public life. Uh, so in terms of uh, the key economic moments uh, in uh, the uh, recent history of the European Union, I guess I'd have to pick out three different phases of our economic integration and economic development. The first one will be the introduction of the Euro itself. 
Uh, as many of you know, we are marking and approaching the anniversary of the introduction of the euro as a physical currency later on in the year. But the introduction of the euro, while of course it was a profoundly uh, and deeply significant economic event, it was also a profoundly important political moment because it signaled the desire of, all, of many members of the European project to use our political interdependence, our shared values, to create a further phase of deeper economic interdependence for the benefit of all. Uh, and uh, I can remember the moment I saw my first euro, uh, and it has had such a profound effect, not only on our economic development in Ireland and that of the European Union, but also on our political development, and has, was and remains a profound moment in the history of the European project. The second moment that I would pick would be far more difficult moments around the global financial crisis from 2007 onwards that underscored to many of us, particularly within Ireland, that as important as the architecture of the euro was, it was an architecture that uh, was essentially incomplete and some key pillars, some really important uh, foundations uh, of that architecture remained to be built. Uh, and uh, we learned the difficulty involved in that, but we also learned that when that architecture was complete or was built further, I should say, rather than complete at moments of great challenge, it made a profound difference to our ability to overcome some of the challenges of that era. And that brings me up to more recent moments, the more recent moments of the pandemic. Uh, and those moments of the pandemic demonstrated many things, uh, including the essential and um, profound role of our central bank in the ECB, the work of Professor Lane and his colleagues in the Governing Council. But it also demonstrated, I believe, two qualities. The first quality was the importance of the architecture that we have worked hard to develop further during the global financial crisis and continue in its aftermath. That architecture ended up being used in a fundamentally different way to combat the pandemic. And it also demonstrated something very political. It demonstrated our willingness to stand together, to realize that interdependence had to be a source of strength and to realize that if we were combating a disease that used interdependence to travel and used contact to harm, we would have to use our interdependence as a source of resilience. And there was a deep political unity to do that. Uh, unity isn't always easily achieved. It can sometimes look difficult in the spotlight of media and political focus. But at the end of the day, that unity was found. Uh, and as I think we'll touch on in other moments in our debate, that unity will yet play an essential role in a rebound and then a recovery that we need to nurture. So three quick moments for me, uh, Francis. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, I've, I've always learned that when somebody pitches an easy question to me, it's frequently anything but. Uh, but it's, I guess it's a good way of framing uh, the early part of our discussion. Thank you very much. So Philip, you can come in with the same three or three different ones. I know you'll articulate them differently anyway. Well, well I mean, uh, in the context of, of course, uh, I'm going to live myself to the kind of economic and financial dimensions of, of integration. Uh, and before I answer, I, I would also join in and congratulating the Institute on, on 30 years. And I would note, and it's in line uh, with, with some of the, I think, the narrative uh, of this, of this uh, event, it, it was so important uh, to, to expand the scope of the Institute to be the Institute for International and European Affairs. Because of course, uh, the role of Europe and uh, the role of uh, whether it, it's monetary union or all the other dimensions of integration it, is not just to, to kind of uh, address or solve within Europe coordination issues. It's to make sure that Europe um, is set up to deal with, with global, with global uh, uh, trends, global shocks, of which the pandemic is the most recent. Um, so, I mean, I, I broadly have, have similar uh, time periods in mind. Uh, when I was looking back, and I'm, I'm no uh, 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 historian, 
uh, when I was trying to think, okay, what exactly, when exactly was the key date in terms of the formation of the euro? Now, I agree uh, with, with the minister. It is important because it, for many people, it is a physical reality of notes and coins uh, really brought it home. Um, but uh, one key European Council was at uh, Madrid in December 1995, when uh, I think the January 1, 99 date was locked in. And so, so that was, if you like, uh, for those involved, uh, and of course many uh, in the audience, I'm sure, uh, the amount of preparation uh, needed to, to launch a monetary union. There was the predecessor European Monetary Institute uh, with some key uh, Irish officials, by the way, uh, in word from you know date zero before the euro was launched. Uh, and just as the, the minister was referencing there about the, the kind of incomplete architecture, a lot of choices would have been made in the mid 1990s, you know, and in fact a bit earlier, uh, in terms of what what was necessary and what could uh, could wait in terms of the formation of a monetary union. Um, in, in terms of thinking about the, the, the broad uh, period of the global financial crisis and then the European uh, sovereign debt crisis, I'm going to maybe in a particular way uh, focus on July 2012, uh, which of course is when uh, Mario Draghi made a whatever it takes speech. But what I want to emphasize with that is that would, uh, should not be interpreted as a standalone event because a lot of uh, independent elements were necessary in order uh, for, for the ECB to take on that role. It was important that the European stability mechanism was set up. It was important that we had a, a fiscal compact. It was important uh, that progress had also been made, for example, uh, in terms of the uh, launching a banking union. So the role of, of the central bank needs always to be understood in, in the wider context of, of the different responsibilities of different uh, elements of the European uh, institutional framework. And that brings me to the third element, which relates to the pandemic, uh, which is basically the agreement about next generation EU. So th there should be no doubt in terms of um, the resilience of the euro area, the, uh, you know, I think, uh, success so far in making sure that the financial aspects of the pandemic ha have been handled it is the fact that Europe uh, did uh, fundamentally agree uh, and many people around the world were asking the question, you know, will Europe stand together? And having next generation EU as one component in, in the response has been uh, so important. And uh, if you like, uh, uh, the, work, the job of the central bank uh, can, can never be taken in isolation, it's so important that these other elements have been in place. So if you like, uh, on all of those uh, fronts, uh, that's what I want to emphasize, it's we, we have to think about the whole system together. Uh, and those to me were, were three elements where you can zero in on a particular announcement or a particular speech, um, but it's all the interlocking parts uh, are so important uh, for, for the resilience of, of the euro area. So just coming from next to that one, one item, and when you're asked for three, of course, <laughs> notably there was a contender for fourth, fifth and sixth place. I suppose one I'd like to maybe both to comment on and partly linking back to what the minister said about seeing interdependence as a strength rather than a weakness. I think that's a really very fundamental difference about what it feels like at the moment. It's very much being more in that strength, whereas during the, the financial crisis, it, it didn't feel that, that interdependence. And obviously Brexit is an example where interdependence was being painted as in fact a negative rather than a positive, I think, in some of the discussion in, in, in the public domain. Um, I wonder if you comment at all on, on what you might see as the significance of the of EU enlargement into the East in terms of what the European Union is going to look like in the period ahead, uh, because that in a sense is part of a, an interdependence within Europe that was being created. So Francis, do you want me to? Yeah, okay, sorry, Minister. Uh, sure. So uh, indeed, the enlargement, uh, the enlargement that ha that has taken place, and the prospects for that to grow further, ha have made a profound difference to the uh, the nature of the euro and the form of the economic integration that we have. Uh, so if I look at the current status of the euro. Uh, and the membership of uh, so many of our colleagues, Slovakia, Slovenia, 
uh, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia. If I look at the contribution they make within Europe and within ECOFIN, the contribution they make at about an appreciation of the uh, digital dimension of financial services, some of the debates that are now beginning in relation to the you know, very early phase of the exploratory and technical work uh, that uh, Professor Lane and his colleagues have on the way regarding the digital future of the euro and the appreciation that they have of the uh, political dimension of the euro and how interdependence and connectivity is a source of strength uh, is a very important dimension of the contributions that they regularly make. Uh, and uh, as I look at the phase beyond that, uh, the uh, progress that we are making with our friends and partners in Croatia and in Bulgaria um, underscores how the euro is perceived elsewhere. Uh, and at moments of difficulty, and we have seen this uh, uh, many times, only too recently, uh, when reaching agreement within the European Union and indeed within the Euro area is so intensely hard, it needs to be remembered that one of the reasons why that agreement, in reaching agreement on matters can be so hard, is it leads to resilience in the decisions that are made. And the decisions, the changes that we make, uh, nearly always, if not always, outlast the crisis period within which those decisions are reached. And the difficulty of decision making leads to a resilience of decision. And to those who are outside the euro, but inside the European Union, that is a real source of strength. And it's a strength that they want to share. And you can see that in two different phases, Francis. You can see the number of our colleagues that are not in the euro area, but are very vested in discussions regarding the future of banking union, because they see the externalities of banking union as something that they want to influence. And indeed, some of them, many of them, in fact, would see banking union, which has such a strong euro dimension, as something that they still want to participate in, even if they remain as uh, non-euro partners. And then beyond that, uh, our colleagues in Bulgaria and, and Croatia are working so hard to fulfill the criteria that are being set for ultimate membership. And that isn't just for economic reasons, even though the economic reasons are so essential to their endeavors. Uh, so this is a project which for me, the resilience of which has yet been underpinned, yet been underestimated. And the fact that we again uh, have uh, two friends, partners and neighbors who want to be part of that project demonstrates not only its economic resilience, but also its political resilience. Philip, would you like to come in on that? So uh, let, let me emphasize uh, maybe two points. One is, of course, uh, the membership of the Monty Union has expanded a, a lot from the original 11 members. Um, and from the point of view of a small country, uh, whether it's the global financial crisis or the pandemic really under, underlines the value, the kind of safe harbor effect of being in a monetary union. Uh, essentially, all member countries can uh, raise funding, can operate, uh, make transactions in euro. Uh, so cross-border activity is in the, basically the shared currency. And I think we have a lot of counterexamples of small countries uh, outside of that uh, which, uh, in relation to these large global shocks, it's difficult to run a, a small currency. Now, the other point I would make is, even for those who, who have not joined, and by the way, it's not just uh, EU members, but the wider set of European countries, it, is there is a, a positive uh, spillover from the euro. Uh, for example, the ECB uh, over the last year has provided the option of swap lines and uh, repo lines with, with a range of uh, neighboring countries, uh, because uh, again, the alternative where uh, of uh, you know using the dollar for cross-border transactions, uh, it makes sense that the euro is an important uh, uh, regional currency, not just for the euro area, but for the wider uh, uh, neighborhood of Europe. Uh, and so, uh, it, no matter which country you think about, uh, the the euro does have this kind of uh, I think. Uh, 
uh, profound and positive impact on the, the, the wider European system. Um, and it just goes back to this basic point and you know, the way the euro works is it's shared decision making. I mean, the governing council has representatives from all member countries. Everyone is there as an individual. Uh, we make decisions by consensus. And, and so it's kind of a remarkable, if you like, a setup uh, to, to have that amount of shared decision making. And if I could just emphasize that point, and it's such a, a powerful point uh, uh, made by the professor there, because again, it is the same in our Eurogroup and indeed in our ECOFIN deliberations. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, you know, I do want to acknowledge that very large economies, the larger members of, of Eurogroup and indeed ECOFIN, uh, um, uh, you know, when their views are uh, made clear, of course, they do carry a particular weight given their scale. Um, but as against that, in order to reach really important decisions, consensus is needed. And it is, for me, the most uh, uh, powerful demonstration possible of the difference between sovereignty in theory and sovereignty in practice. Uh, and that uh, was demonstrated for me so vividly in the many meetings we had of both Eurogroup and ECOFIN in the darkest days of the pandemic, where again, to Philip's point, Ireland's ability to respond back to that shock was amplified beyond scale by the fact that we were considering how to respond back and then using common economic instruments with other members of a shared currency. Uh, and those moments and those nights for me, uh, the action then of our central bank, uh, for me are, are a package of examples that powerfully demonstrate the uh, enormous value of a shared currency, particularly if you're a small open economy inside a shared currency. Yeah, I think, the, the, I think there, there's, 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 there'll, there'll be continuing work, as far as I can see, to be done in that narrative being understood very widely by all the citizens of the union who are involved in this, because I think it often gets lost. And there's a sense in which loss of sovereignty, as opposed to the positivity of independent interdependence has been very corrupted, I think, potentially in, in, in the minds of a lot of people in trying to understand uh, how, we, how we are going forward. So, but let me take, take you talked about and referenced on a number of occasions, the, the, um, the pandemic. And I think it is, you know, for us today, it's obviously the, the big event, uh, but it's also been a big event from a European perspective. And I suppose my question here really is from where the two of you stand, what major lessons from handling 2008 financial crisis have informed what has happened so much, seems to be from the outside, much better in handling COVID-19? And maybe Philip, you'd start on, on, on that question. Uh, I mean, it's definitely true that uh, having, if you like, the experience of having, uh, have to, having to manage a crisis even if the crisis was fundamentally different in nature, uh, definitely meant that the kind of playbook existed. Uh, there was a playbook about uh, what a central bank needs to do. Now, at some level, this, this is, there's nothing particularly uh, Euro-specific about this, because by and large, uh, central banks everywhere had very similar response, which is uh, very important when the market had to absorb uh, this really rather sudden news uh, last March. Uh, there's an important imperative to stabilize markets very quickly. Uh, and that required very large uh, expansion of our balance sheet, whether through asset purchases, and again, not, not just of sovereign, but also uh, a lot of uh, commercial paper, corporate bonds, uh, to, to stabilize the money markets. Uh, a lot of liquidity to banks. One of the remarkable phases of this, and the biggest contrast with, with 08 is uh, credit has been growing quite strongly in this crisis. There's been no credit crunch, there's been no credit contraction, and it's so important when so many uh, firms needed uh, liquidity given the sudden loss of revenue, that it is very important that that banking sector uh, dimension was addressed. And then the third element was, you know, we've lived through this huge drop in economic activity, uh, and that, that posed clear risks to price stability. So it's very important to essentially maintain and continue to maintain an accommodative uh, monetary policy stance. Now, I would say, uh, if you think about the world today versus the, the world uh, uh, 13 or 14 years ago, 
a, a fundamental pervasive topic which runs through everything, which is essentially the global level of interest rates these days is very low. Going into 08, uh, interest rates were still relatively high. They were still, uh, you know, through pretty high oil price mid 2000s and so on. Inflation was not especially low. So, so the kind of level of, of interest rates, which matters for sovereigns, it matters for indebted households, it matters for corporates. If you like, the, the global anchor for interest rates these days is a lot lower. And, and that really does change the, the picture. So, you know, the conjecture of what a pandemic would, would have looked like if it happened in 08 is, is an entirely different question. So when we compare uh, the two periods, of course, you can compare the different elements of, of the uh, crisis dynamics. But this basic fundamental global point is, is pervades everything. And, you know, the level of, of the interest rate environment is so different today. So, yes. so to, to, to just, just to add to that, and I pick up on an earlier point in our discussion uh, about the value of never seeing any event in isolation. Uh, and just as certain actions in the aftermath of, well, during, the, great the global financial crisis were only possible because of what had preceded them or took place at the same time. Uh, similarly, if I look at our response back to the pandemic, the responses that happened at a policy and an institutional level did build upon and did, did use institutions and understandings and the experiences that were built up in our last crisis. Uh, and uh, that was certainly, from a political point of view, a really important context to the decision making that I was involved in, participated, or saw happening. And if I would give two examples of that, uh, the first one is that the uh, integration and the coordination of monetary policy and fiscal policy is clearly at a far different nature and far different level than would have been the case uh, and was the case a decade ago. And the actions of our central bank, the actions in the extensive monetary intervention that they put in place, the actions of the European Commission in the very clear signaling that was sent out regarding the activation of general escape clause and the indications regarding the future of next generation EU fundamentally changed the background for fiscal decisions that were made at national level. And policy makers, in, including myself, though, I was only a member of government in the aftermath of the last crisis, as opposed to during the darker moments of it. Um, we had clear lessons uh, that we vividly remember regarding how you use fiscal policy in the aftermath of a crisis that really mattered then when you were in the depth of this one. Uh, but there was an integration of policy making that has made a huge difference. And for example, uh, in Ireland's case, our ability to put in place economic supports uh, that have worked, that have made a huge difference, that have stood behind our citizens when they needed support, um, were enabled by what happened at European level. And that is, that, that's just critical. It's profound to where we are now. Um, and then again, uh, again, to make a political point, what I saw very vividly uh, in between March and up to the summer of last year was an appreciation of our economic interdependence and that we would only pull through this if we were going to pull through this together. And that was a, a really powerful instinct and dimension to the debates that happened across that period which again was influenced by all we went through a decade ago. I mean, one of the things that's very striking, of course, is that there was a common shock this time, which was different to the previous time. There's, there's asymmetry in the way it's experienced by countries, but the commonality of the shock and no blame going with it. I mean, do you think looking at the, the European institutions now that that commonality of experience has strengthened the interdependency uh, just by virtue of it having happened. In other words, here's Europe collectively dealing with a shared external shock uh, that's affected everybody and come out of nowhere and nobody's to blame. Has that been a positive thing, do you think, for the institutions? I suppose I'm thinking of you, Minister, overall, right across the, 
the monetary, fiscal, the various domains. So I think you, uh, uh, the commonality, uh, kind of, uh, you only get so far, I guess, in the, in the commonality uh, continuum. Because, uh, yes, it is the case that in the origins of the crisis, it had its origins in biology, in a public health risk. It did not happen due to uh, decisions about economic uh, policy or regulatory mismanagement. This was a profoundly different crisis uh, that uh, uh, had its origins outside of economics. But of course, the public health decisions have found economic consequences. However, on the other hand, while I think it is the case that we were facing a common experience, the impact on different economies within the euro area um, is still divergent. And that divergence is a risk that we are deeply aware of. And underneath the, you know, the terminology and lingo of things like macroeconomic imbalances, it does speak to the fact that depending on the structure of your economy, and not just the size of your economy, the structure of it, the repercussions of this common experience can be very, very divergent. And uh, that, that was a really important driver then for next generation EU. But then on the other hand, yes, you are correct, that for example, when our commission, Commissioner uh, Dombrovskis, Gentiloni, uh, and of course the president of the commission were looking at how they can respond back to that, they were aware that our common project was at risk uh, and they were aware that some of the narrative of the last decade was absent and had to be absent in decisions that we would make. Uh, and uh, uh, so, yes, indeed, commonality gets us so far, but it's awareness of the lack of a common experience, depending on the structure of your economy, that in turn led to the common response back that is next generation EU. Philip, want to come in on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, it's maybe important uh, to make two, two further points. One is in uh, 2007, uh, August of 7, we just, the start of the stress in the global financial system, there was a sustained period where it was perceived as a common shock. It was the global financial crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, and the ECB was uh, early at the gates in 07. And if you go back to, to the early years of, of that long extended crisis, uh, you know, many of the points we're making now were made then about the value of having a common currency. But of course, uh, then, then there's a mutation, if you like, in, in that crisis into a sovereign debt crisis, which are so divergent across, across the member countries and so difficult to, to handle. Now, what I want to emphasize in terms of uh, the link is all of the reform made after the last crisis uh, has been actually important uh, uh, preconditions for how this crisis has been handled. And for example, the fact we do not have a single supervisory mechanism means that essentially through the meetings of the uh, supervisory board, a lot of uh, supervisory action took place, mm -hmm. uh, which are in many ways quite technical, but quite important for the ability of the banking, European banking system uh, to respond. You can only imagine the coordination problems and the suspicions if national banking supervisors were making independent, uncoordinated decisions. Mm -hmm. so, so the SSM, uh, you know, um, which of course is a different wing from the ECB, uh, it, it is, it has been so important. And I would emphasize uh, also, even though of course there's many uh, debates about the fiscal framework, the fiscal rules, fiscal compact, the fact that uh, it was strengthened, that uh, even though many debates continue, that broadly going into this crisis, fiscal positions were such that, uh, you know, that it was possible, there was the fiscal space to respond uh, to this crisis. And, you know, at some point uh, uh, when the recovery is secure, um, uh, it, it does illustrate an issue that, that, that will uh, uh, come up again, which is, uh, you know, uh, in order to have that capacity to respond uh, to these kind of disasters, you know, how do you rebuild that fiscal space, you know, um, in, in kind of a, a so-called normal times, you know, uh, and of course that's going to be 
uh, I'm sure an issue in the upcoming uh, debate about the, the, the uh, stability and growth pact. So just, just kind of taking that as a starting point, I mean, there's a sense in which going into this crisis, we had better fiscal space and we've had low interest rates. So they've been very much on, you know, ha ha have facilitated the way in which it's possible, it's been possible to get wider agreement. I just question really to both of you is, I mean, how would you see Europe continuing to improve the resilience and strength of, of, the, of, the, of the Euro area currency and the, you know, the European institutions, I guess, over the next period of time? And what do you think are the crucial steps? Because as, as I think, Minister, you said earlier on, it's always going to be evolving. This is not a job that's ever fully done. It's a complex governance situation. It's always going to be dealing with and, and developing. But obviously, the more you can anticipate and be ready for, uh, the better that's going to be. So I suppose my question really is, what do you see as the, the ways we can have of improving the resilience of the, of, the, of the Euro and strengthening of the European Union generally? over the next period while we're doing everything. And you've mentioned a number of times the, the, um, the new European uh, proposals that are coming out at the moment. Do you think they're the key to it? Well, I respond back to yes. answer first. Sorry, okay, back. sure. So the, the, uh, sure, I, um, I think there's three areas in which we will look at how we can uh, further deepen the resilience and strength of the Euro on the Euro area. Um, but, but before we do that, it kind of reminds me of uh, the uh, ever the needed debates that we have in politics about the need for change. And I think it's always worth emphasizing when we look at what we need to change, what has also been achieved. And even, for example, just in the recent months, the agreement that was reached um, in uh, the Eurogroup and in the Eurogroup in an extended format regarding changes about the single resolution fund and the operation of the European stability mechanism. Uh, these are things uh, that uh, much work had gone on, were very, very difficult, uh, but through our shared efforts, we reached agreement on at the end of last November, which is another part of how we move forward with banking union. Uh, but to answer your question regarding how we need to move forward, three areas, and I'm gonna begin with the blind and the obvious, the first one is the ability of the euro area in particular to recover from the pandemic and to recover in a sustained way. Uh, we have, I believe, a rebound that is still underestimated in terms of how strong it will be across the euro area in the second half of this year and in next year. I believe the combination of our vaccination efforts uh, and next generation EU and the right decisions that have been made at national level with the constant enabling background of the guidance the central bank has provided, um, are contributing and will lead to a, a recovery that is beginning. But we need to turn that is into something that is sustained. And we are too quick at times to evaluate success or failure. We're purely on the metric of where we're going to be in December 21 or December 22. We have to look beyond that to what is the sustained nature of the recovery that we can deliver. Uh, secondly, it is banking union, the future of banking union, how we can move beyond where we are, which is something I'm putting a huge amount of effort into at the moment, seeing if we can reach agreement regarding the next projects that we want to make progress on and by when. And then thirdly, even though it should be uh, emphasized, it is, this is not Euro specific, it will be, going back to my first point, how we craft our budgetary policy in an atmosphere that is still highly uncertain, um, and then use that as um, a, a segue into the debate, which will happen in ECOFIN, which will be instigated by our commission in relation to the future of the fiscal rules and uh, what they will be and how they will be crafted. And I think there are the three areas, but I would emphasize it's the first area. Um, if we cannot show to our citizens and to the world uh, our ability to deliver a durable recovery from where we are now, that, that is the foundation on which we build uh, other elements of strengthening. Philip, would you like to come in on that? Yeah, so, so I mean, I, in terms of categories, I mean, I, I think those categories are, are the right categories. I mean, you know, I, and I can recall over the last decade, uh, all of the debates we, we've had about different topics, for example, 
to take one topic, uh, the ability of the European banking system to address the non-performing loan issue, you know, which has been you know, a big issue in Ireland, but you know, in many parts of Europe. Um, but essentially, uh, we saw from that episode, and it's, it's, it's a more general point, is good macroeconomic performance, good sustained macroeconomic performance it is the, the foundation uh, in terms of building trust, building confidence, um, um, uh, and building a sense of coherence that essentially we're all uh, on the same track. So, so I, I think um, uh, it's, if we think about the next number of years, uh, we, we clearly have two phases of that. One is uh, to, to make sure that the uh, initial rebound, because we are seeing it now. We are seeing now, uh, if you like, uh, coming out of lockdown uh, and with vaccinations uh, progressing, um, there will be a, a, re a rebound from the very low levels of activity. It, it should not be underestimated, the scale of the drop in activity, which of course is being concentrated in certain sectors. Mm -hmm. And uh, for those countries where those sectors are bigger parts of the economy, it should not uh, be underestimated the scale of that. And that's, again, it's really a global point. Uh, and what's necessary is to recognize uh, a rebound does not deliver a sustained recovery. And uh, this is why one of the nice features of Next Generation EU, it's a five-year project. It's, it's not just about you know, uh, having a, a, a very transitory uh, uh, stimulus, it, it's essentially a platform uh, for for um, medium term growth performance, and uh, you know I, we're a medium term organisation as the ECB, so definitely uh, looking beyond the noise, looking beyond uh, some short term fluctuations in, in various data, and looking about well where do we think the economy is going to be uh, two years from now, uh, and going further you know five years from now. So in terms of of course all sorts of factors will, will matter for that. Uh, world technological developments, uh, all sorts of factors will matter. And of course, we have a lot of debates about uh, digitalization, uh, the green transition and so on. But in terms of policy making at a European level, uh, to, to me, uh, the, the three dimensions. Uh, I, I've completely uh, endorsed uh, all of the work uh, to make progress on banking union and capital markets union. And that should not be seen as a zero one. You know, we don't, it's not the case we either don't or we do have a, a banking union. Uh, it's to, to make further progress um, uh, to, towards uh, uh, making it better than what we have now. I mean, a lot is in place, but we need more. Uh, and so it, it's basically, it's a long march. Uh, but what I would emphasize is behind banking union, capital markets union, is further integration of the single market. Uh, because I mean, this has been going on for decades, but we know uh, it's still the case, especially in services, that there's a lot of domestic regulations, a lot of kind of non-tariff barriers and so on. And if you like, uh, if we have a more integrated economy, uh, the uh, integration of, of banking systems and capital markets uh, go hand in hand. And then the third element is, uh, and this is where the track record comes in, um, you know, conceptually, uh, the, the kind of uh, elements that have gone into next generation EU do provide a, a template. And I'm not going to enter the debate whether that should be permanent or it's only reserved for truly exceptional circumstances. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I think we will learn a lot. We will learn a lot in, in the coming years uh, about the nature of, the, of that program which of course is not just uh, about finance, it's also about the, the, the uh, more general uh, ingredients in, in the country by country recovery plans. So, you know, it, it's, uh, I think, uh, uh, again, the pandemic was unexpected, uh, totally yeah. unwelcome, it's still uh, obviously a, a total disaster, uh, but to the extent, uh, you know, it, it leads to, to uh, you know, innovation, and, it, you know, we, we should definitely, uh, where we can, uh, Take advantage of those innovations, but you know, going back to the, to the basic point is all of this uh, is completely intertwined with overall macroeconomic performance, uh, and that's uh, again to re-emphasize not uh, about just returning to where we were in 2019. It's about uh, returning to the trend path, uh, you know, because of course we've lost a couple of years of growth, and actually, you know, even better given that uh, Europe has been a slow-growing. Uh, 
place even better to, to boost the, the, the trend performance for your area. So we have a lot of a lot of questions coming in from the audience at this stage, and, and there's a number a number of themes emerging. You won't be too surprised about, uh, but one maybe to start start on on uh, the discussion that linked to what we've talked about already um, relates really to the inflation and returning inflation, and particularly in relation perhaps to the to the to the United States. So one question from Bill Emmett, who's former editor in chief of the Economist and is chair of the Trinity Long Room Hub, and he makes the, the statement and asks. So he says inflation is rising in the United States, leading to the prospects of rising dollar interest rates, possibly gradually, possibly sharply. What impact do you see this happening? I, I, I see this as happening on the euro area and on euro area economic policy. And I suppose it plays to the opening remarks both of you made that that uh, Europe is situated in a global world, not just in its own world. So I don't know who would like to start with that. Minister, do you want to take that question to start I, with? I, I'll let Philip take the lead on that, and then I'll come in afterwards. So. Great. OK. OK. Uh, so I mean, I think, um, uh, and I, I wrote a piece for the ECB website a few weeks ago about this. I mean, by and large, a lot of what we've seen now is just a reversal of what we saw last year. So in the spring of last year, there was a big plunge in oil prices. That's now been unwound. Uh, of course, when you have a, a lot of people, uh, you know, the good news is, is the recovery, the rebound is stronger globally than many people expected. So what we've seen is uh, various industries were too pessimistic. Uh, so there's shortages, for example, in semiconductors, uh, there was con uh, constraints uh, in some shipping routes. And of course, when you have an unplanned uh, bottleneck, there's going to be some price action. But that is not inflation. That is just, you know, kind of supply and demand. And we know when you have those kind of price spikes, as uh, supply tends to respond. I mean, the price uh, of, uh, of uh, PPE masks, you know, today is very different to, to, to uh, a year ago. Uh, someone famously, I saw a recent, some recent note about the kind of, uh, 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 you know, a lot of discussion a year ago about toilet roll uh, shortages, which, you know, the market does respond. So I just think there's a nearly zero connection between any kind of spikes in prices on the reopening of the world economy and uh, what goes into uh, the inflation trend. And here I would emphasize is, uh, you know, two thirds of the European uh, price index, and the same in America for that, is services. And when we think about what goes into services inflation, it's basically uh, uh, the labor market, uh, and both in the US and in Europe, the labor market is nowhere near, and it, there's no prospect of a super rapid uh, uh, bounce back. And then this is so important about going back to rebound and recovery, is uh, you know, we all, you know, we also at the ECB agree there's gonna be a, a, a good, uh, rebound this year and next year. Uh, but that's reliant on a lot of policy support. There's a huge labor market challenge coming up about uh, not just uh, getting people back into working who have been you know, forced out of their work because of social restrictions. Uh, but we also know that it's going to be this, this trend shift because we don't, none of us, I think, think the world is going to be exactly the same uh, after the pandemic as before in relation to working from home, travel and so on. And uh, labor markets, all markets find it difficult to deal with that kind of reallocation. So there's a huge uh, challenges here. So the idea that the world uh, and the euro area has a, a kind of environment that is set up for persistent inflation, uh, I just don't see it. So we, we think, uh, you know, we are providing a lot of monetary accommodation. Uh, there is a fiscal support, which, you know, uh, does help the inflation dynamic. But in our recent projections, we're projecting in 2023, uh, two years from now, inflation in the euro area will be at 1.4, which is far below our aim. So we have a lot of work to do. Uh, and so this narrative of a, of a new inflationary environment, uh, I, I just uh, put very little weight on. You just have to look at the inflationary trends in the context of where we are with other developments in our economy and other economic indicators. Philip has touched on them. Let me just develop two of them further. Look at the extent of underemployment we have within the euro area. Look at the level of unemployment that we have in many other deeply important economic trade, uh, global economic partners. Uh, secondly, all over the world, businesses are recreating themselves. They are literally restocking 
in front of our eyes. Uh, we have retailers restocking. We have uh, those who are involved in manufacturing and construction, ordering, searching for new raw materials. Uh, we have supply chains that are reawakening. And if we make the case that I think both of us are, that a, a rebound is the first phase of a recovery, but not the entirety of a recovery. Similarly, we have to be alert to what a rebound may involve and what will take place in the aftermath of a rebound as we try to move into a more stable growth environment. And uh, so of course, we're always aware of risks and developments and always considering um, what, the, what, what the future could bring, but you have to anchor this debate in every other challenge uh, that economic policy makers are confronting at the moment. I mean, I think one of the, one of the challenges is, is that even quarter to quarter inflation co figures coming from the US seem to put people into a panic that this is the beginning of some inflationary spiral completely out of context. So that notion of confusing spi price spikes with real inflationary trends, it just seems to be endemic uh, at the moment. Maybe, I mean, it is important to say compared to last year. I mean, last year, there was a lot of pessimism, at least the financial markets were putting a lot of weight on really pessimistic outcomes. So what is true is that we do uh, now, clearly with the vaccinations rolling out, uh, we do see um, compared to the, those awful scenarios, uh, we, we, there's a, a brighter outlook. But, but, you know, so the fact, I mean, there is an element of what's going on which is basically the market pricing out disaster scenarios. Uh, the fact that they're pricing out disaster scenarios is not the same thing as saying we're entering some new inflationary environment. Uh, and that's essentially uh, the situation. Uh, and of course, uh, when, you, when you look at the, the most recent, uh, uh, I mean, as I say, you, know, you have to, in this scenario, whether it's about GDP, unemployment, inflation, look at the level, not the most recent change. Because when you're climbing out of a hole, you're still in a hole. It's, you know, so a rebound when you're, you know, I say you're, you, we haven't even, we're not getting back to 2019 GDP until early next year in our calculations. Uh, but we should not, that is not, that's just kind of a stage one. Uh, we will we'll be below where we should be in terms of trend. Uh, we think in our calculations, unemployment will take another year. Mm -hmm. You know, it's another year, you know, yeah. so GDP is not the, the kind of a uh, uh, sole metric. It's going to be another year for, for the unemployment to come down. Uh, so, you know, it, it, uh, and of course, there's so many corporates coming out of this with, a, you know, with compromised balance sheets. So their ability to invest, you know, um, that their the requirement to make sure fiscal support is, is, is not lifted too quickly is going to be very important. So, I mean, it's very interesting. I'm, I just got the new book by uh, Daniel Kahneman and other, you know, mm -hmm. on, on noise. But the psychology now, the, people are looking for, they're delighted. I mean, I'm delighted to, 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 to see the vaccinations. People are going to be happier. And of course, public health trumps everything else. Uh, but we, we, we do have to take the, the kind of uh, medium-term perspective and not confuse uh, a reopening of the world economy with some new golden era. So I want to move a little bit over on the sort of fiscal side. A number of people have raised questions relating to that. And I don't have an opportunity to read out all of them. But there's a question from um, Aidan Regan in UCD, which goes as follows. If the fiscal deficit and public debt rules were suspended to fight public health pandemic, is it time to recognise that there needs, the same needs to happen to fight the climate emergency and in Ireland, the, 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 the housing crisis? So I suppose this is getting at the notion of whether reform of fiscal rules, which other people have referred to as well, which Mr Draghi has, 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 has pointed to as well, need to be part of where, where, um, where we go next. And Minister, I think that's one for you rather than for Philip. Sure, well, under the uh, uh, current fiscal rules, uh, Ireland increased its capital investment, for example, in housing, uh, uh, to Professor Regan's point there, from around 900 million euro per year in 2016 to 3.2 billion euro per year in 2021. So enhanced and growing capital expenditure is possible, uh, even under the existing uh, fiscal rules. And of course, the antidote back to the great challenges we have with regard to housing at the moment are more than just expenditure, though expenditure is a hugely important part of it. 
there are many other things that we have to reflect and change upon. Uh, but for example, under the current rules and the prevailing sentiment of the financial markets then, uh, we increased the number of houses that the state was directly building per year to from below 1,000 in 2015 and 2016, which was far too low, to uh, between five and 6,000 per year now. So we increased capital expenditure and significantly increased capital expenditure is possible under the current architecture that is there, even with the, uh, particularly of course, with the activation of the general estate clause. In terms of how we move beyond that, uh, I always need to make clear when we move into this terrain of fiscal rules uh, that I'm speaking as Minister for Finance for Ireland rather than President of the Eurogroup, because the fiscal rules is an EU-wide debate and an EU-wide discussion, because of course it includes our non-euro um, friends and partners. Uh, but beyond that, uh, I do believe there is going to be um, uh, an increased uh, appreciation uh, regarding the huge, the, the role of capital expenditure and the need to keep that either stable at high levels or grow it further. Because if I look at where we were in the aftermath of 08 to 12 to 13, one of the many lessons that I learned from that is that when you uh, significantly reduce capital expenditure, even if you believe it is justified at the time, uh, the consequences of that are always there in the future. When you reduce the number of houses that are being built in a country for a number of years, um, sometimes for reasons beyond your control, that has massive consequences then with where you are with the supply of homes to your society, and then particularly if the performance of your economy really begins to change. Uh, so given where we are at the moment, significant changes in capital expenditure are already possible. And as we move beyond that, uh, I do believe there will be an increased debate regarding how capital expenditure can better enhance the growth performance of your economy and better help us respond back to uh, the climate emergency and our ability to mitigate it and respond back to us. Of course, it's not about expenditure, it's also about taxation. It's why we've increased the price uh, of carbon for two years in a row in, in, here in Ireland. Um, and the, despite the consensus that is sometimes claimed to be there regarding climate crisis, it's still the case uh, that most political parties in Ireland vote against increasing carbon taxation. And of course, that plays a vital role in changing private capital decisions, not just public capital investment. So today's today's conference, I suppose, is starting by looking back 30 years, looking back over 30 years, and we obviously now also want to look forward. What are the things that are going to be out there over the next over the next uh, 30 years? And, and I suppose one of the, the issues that I know both of you have spoken about, and I'd just be interested to hear maybe this audience would like to hear your views on, uh, relates to digital currency and the development of digital currency in the euro, euro area and the role of, if you like, the ECB and others as regulators of that process. Because imagining this conference in 10 years time, looking 40 years back, I'm absolutely sure that that digital development would be something that will have taken place. So would you, uh, maybe Philip, starting with you, would you like to comment on that? So, uh, as you can tell, uh, around the world, uh, this is really uh, uh, moving along now. So I think there's been some conceptual breakthroughs about how to uh, bring in a digital currency. So right now, you know, we're at a very early stage of, of thinking about it. Uh, so there's, there's no uh, decisions, and it's clear uh, if we made a decision to go in that direction, there would also be a, a huge amount of different dimensions to think about. Um, so from a central bank point of view, of course, you know, as a, as a kind of a, a, a responsibility for, for money, uh, there's a very large attempt there. But maybe, I mean, people have very different perspectives on this, but what I would say is uh, that, that this should, should be seen as essentially uh, evolutionary, uh, that essentially, you know, that uh, we will still have a currency we will still have the fact, as we have already, a, a lot of money essentially these days takes electronic form already in terms of uh, uh, making payments from your bank account, uh, making uh, uh, payments through your various apps and so on. 
Uh, and having a digital currency, I think uh, uh, th there's a clear conceptual case. Uh, there's a lot of practical issues uh, uh, to, to think about. But what I would say more generally, and if in the 30 year uh, framing you have, clearly in the digital world, how we think about boundaries is quite different. And this goes back, I mean, imagine uh, without the Euro, we had the 19 uh, current members of the Euro all trying to work out what kind of digital currency you know, should we think about. It goes back to, again, the scale economies, the, the kind of value of having a single uh, currency is going to be reinforced in the digital world. So having um, a, a kind of a digital currency, uh, a Euro digital currency, again, uh, if the decision is uh, on that, it's, it's, it's a good idea. Uh, to me, again, illustrates the value of, of that major decision uh, 25, 30 years ago to, to form the monetary union. And to, to add to that, the first thing to say is that in any such debate and any such developments, and we're at an incredibly early stage in relation to it, uh, the independence of our central bank uh, in uh, the euro area um, is the anchor to a stable discussion about this, let alone any developments with regard to us. And again, it goes back to the value of the institutions that we have. And as this is debated more and more, I, I just think it's important to focus in on what is the nature of the potential instrument that we are discussing. Uh, and it is only potential at this point. And it is having, um, at the very least, a means of payment uh, that is safe, that is stable. And I also believe simple in the context of developments that could take place in the private sector with regard to this. Um, and as I look at where we could be over a 30-year horizon and indeed beyond, uh, there are for me as a politician um, uh, two important dimensions to this. Uh, the first one is, is the creation and the definition of money uh, is inherently political. It's intimately related into the exercise of economic sovereignty, either as a sovereign on its own or in the euro area through shared sovereignty. And that is a deeply, deeply precious and powerful quality, deeply important. Um, and in the debate that is yet to come, let alone decisions that are yet to be made, as president of the euro group, it's a theme uh, in this discussion and in this process that is just vital for me. Um, and, and then secondly is the issue of financial inclusion and the risks of financial exclusion. Uh, we touched a moment ago regarding that powerful moment of the physical manifestation of a currency. Uh, a theme in the, uh, in the debate that we are having, and this is, I must recognize, very well understood uh, by the ECB in the thinking they're doing about it, is that um, if the euro area and the euro is a currency for all, for those of us who live in the euro area, it's so vital as we think of the digital future of the euro that that is delivered to. Um, and that is by the care with which this is being evaluated by uh, our central bank is so important uh, because I know they're very much aware of that. Uh, Minister, you would not be surprised, I think every event you go to, uh, the corporate tax rate and the future reform of taxes in Europe and under the OECD comes up, and I know this is sort of something you're, you're familiar with, and there have been, needless to say, quite a lot of questions have come in on, 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 on this today, but let me just uh, take one of them, uh, which, which as with, well, a couple of them maybe, maybe together, um, can Ireland's economy, this is from Hannah DC. Uh, or sorry, I beg your pardon, Gareth Keane at Zurich Insurance. How can Ireland's economy continue to thrive after our corporate tax advantages are removed or at least substantially reduced? And a second question related to the, the fact that, um, uh, sorry, to do with the fact that we Department of Finance forecasts uh, have estimated that Ireland stands to lose approximately 2 billion due to reforms in international corporate tax rate. Is there a potential that these figures will, uh, will be underestimate the true budgetary impact of a deal at the OECD? So I suppose there's this, this set of questions that will always come up and we park Philip for a moment on the side while we let you uh, deal with those if you would. Of course, Francis. And then again, at this point, I need to make explicitly clear that I'm speaking as Minister for Finance for Ireland. 
I'm not, of course, the president of the Eurogroup because the Eurogroup plays no role at all with regard to taxation. Uh, to begin with Gareth's point, of course we can respond. Of course Ireland will be competitive. Of course we will be able to continue to grow our economy in any of the scenarios that may present themselves with regard to corporate tax. And you have to take a step back to look at where our economy stands at the moment. You could indeed have made the case uh, that um, at other points in our economic development, the role of tax played a, a, a defining role in relation to our competitiveness. Uh, it is now a really important pillar of our competitiveness, but we have many other pillars to that competitiveness, many other parts of our economic model, and they will be more important in the future, and we will recognise that, and we will respond back to it. And in a debate in which I've been very active in and very involved in now over the last number of years as finance minister for our country, uh, while I am probably more than anybody aware of the risks in relation to it, uh, I'm also equally clear uh, that our country has the ability to respond back to it uh, and to find familiar ways and indeed new ways in which we will be able to support our economy and to uh, support its growth, and by doing so, create the resources for our people and for our society. Um, in relation to the impact on revenue, of course, what we do, Francis, at any given point, is we prepare revenue estimates on the basis of information that is available to us at any point in time, and then by the application of our judgment. That figure could change, it could change in both directions, though, depending on what is the nature of the OECD agreement. Uh, I have said now for a number of years, change is coming. It's the reason why I argued so strongly for us balancing our books and then moving into a surplus. It's the reason why it was important that Ireland has been running a primary budget surplus since 2014 and then moved into a position of balance and then beyond. Uh, after that, though, I, we would have been significantly in surplus if it had not been for the impact of the pandemic in 2020 and in 2021. And it's also the reason why at the right moment, uh, we will need to begin the journey again towards rebuilding uh, our fiscal resilience. Uh, because change is coming, that change will affect Ireland. Uh, uh, but the, the, the nature of the change and the nature of the agreement is going to be very complex. Uh, because to end on a point that, that, that recognises the challenge, before I reaffirm my view that we will rise to it, an agreement brings risks. But of course, the absence of an agreement also brings risks as well, and also brings significant risks. And I recognise and understand both. Uh, but in either scenario, uh, with sensible decisions, particularly as we exit the pandemic, and with renewed appreciation of other things that really matter in our economy, we will be able to respond back to it. Philip, do you want to come in on that or anything? We'll leave it parked. I, I, I think uh, uh, the tax that goes beyond, well beyond the Silver Central Bank. <laughs> yeah, no, I was going to, I was going to actually put to some extent a related question, which is, I suppose it's about the canvas of what the OECD is doing. I mean, what's become necessary to do this is the pattern of globalization that's taken place and the way in which taxes were designed in a pre-globalized world suddenly work to be quite different along the line. And countries take different positions now on where taxes should be levied than they may have done uh, way back uh, in, in, in the middle of the last century. Um, but I'm just wondering, in, in terms of that, do you think there's any possibility that the potential for globalized remote working may also be something that might factor into how we think about the taxation of individuals and how that operates in the future. Isn't that something which the OECD will have to canvas as part of this? Because it's something that we wouldn't uh, thought uh, about. The, the, the canvas is so bursting with colour at the moment and has so, many different, has so many different designs on us. I'm not sure at the point they would be, <laughs> be able to accommodate a, 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 a further colour uh, or development. Yeah. Um, and I think the issue of uh, the impact on personal taxation and its relationship to location is probably something, at least in the short term, uh, that will continue to be dealt with by national governments. Uh, but of course, within the European Union, 
uh, that does have a strong uh, background in the basis of the law of the European Union as well. Uh, so I think that is um, the, probably the only single item uh, in relation to uh, global taxation that our friends in the OECD won't be dealing with. Um, but but ju ju just to go back uh, to us, um, you know, the broader case of taxation, uh, it's also the case that when we get into this debate, uh, the case is rarely made for the kind of change that Ireland has already implemented with regard to global taxation. Um, um, I'm by and large the only person that will make this case, uh, and maybe that's the way it should be. But the last number of finance bills that we have brought through, through just because the issues are so complex and technical, from controlled farm companies to hybrids to uh, uh, the uh, changes that we've made in relation to the mandatory disclosure of tax information, to embedding elements of the OECD changes into our national tax law, because they're technical, and maybe because they don't have the headline simplicity of other things, should not underestimate the significance of those decisions. And there are changes that we have made and changes we've made quickly. I pick up from both of you a very optimistic uh, view about where we're, we're going to be able to go in the near term. I mean, you're, you're obviously heading into a summit uh, tomorrow, uh, and that'll be the very, very near term. But just looking out over the next year or two, do you, I mean, do you see the the you know the adjustment, for example, in you know policy from supporting economies widely to getting down to the sectoral level and getting you know, industries like tourism and aviation recovery, but it becomes more sectoral or becomes more regional within Europe. Do you see that that will carry through easily with, at a European level, or do you think it'll be a very big demand on the system to make that move? Maybe you'd start on that, Philip. Well, I mean, uh, it's a very interesting question because um, what I would say is, is we should remember we've never been through this. We've never, uh, at least in modern times, uh, been through the cycle of how the economy uh, gets out of a pandemic phase. So uh, to me, uh, I think there should be a, a lot of uh, uh, integration of, of the uncertainty of this whole process. That, you know, it's not the case, I probably, everything's going to go in one direction in a perfect smooth way. Uh, so the, uh, I mean, so I'll speak about central banking uh, rather, rather than the, the fiscal agenda, and of course, these sectoral issues are inherently fiscal, just central banks, we have kind of uh, broad policies rather than uh, policies that are customized to different sectors. Uh, but it, what, what is true is, is uh, we, and I should say for the last year, the ECB has not just produced its kind of baseline forecast, it's produced uh, optimistic and pessimistic scenarios around that. Uh, and we in terms of policy making, it's important that, that we, it's not just about making conjectures uh, because we can be too optimistic or too pessimistic. It's also trying to sort through the incoming data, the hard data, uh, and sorting out uh, essentially where are we? Where are we in, in this path? And as I indicated earlier on, uh, to me, uh, it's a long journey. Uh, which has different phases. And the initial phase of just reopening and rebounding uh, is, is, is not the final phase. And so having a, a policy setup, if you like having a policy reaction function that differentiates from that initial uh, rebound and then trying to work out, okay, what is persistent? Uh, what, what is fragile? Uh, what is needed? It uh, does mean that, uh, you know, we're always data driven. I think more than usual, uh, really uh, uh, working out uh, which, with traditional data and new forms of data, uh, it, it's really it's going to be a huge challenge for a sustained period uh, to really uh, assess where we are. So, you know, uh, rather than saying that we know where we're going, uh, is to say, look, it, policymakers need to be paying attention uh, and, and need to, to kind of really uh, identify where we are in, in that uh, recovery uh, uh, period. Uh, and so, you know, it, it is very important to not get overexcited uh, about any week or month or quarter of good data and really uh, be humble, if you like, about, uh, you know, what, what the underlying uh, medium term trends are. I mean, there's a lot of <laughs> debate uh, about all sorts of conjectures about the future. And, uh, you know, my attitude to a lot of that is, okay, let's see. 
I mean, let's see uh, where it goes. I mean, is it the case working from home is going to be, you know, remain forever? Is it the case uh, that, that travel is going to be downgraded forever? And uh, there's many questions uh, which can have better or worse answers. Uh, and so, you know, in terms of setting policy, uh, we need to be agile to see, you know, which of those answers emerge over time. Minister, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, look, from my point of view, uh, my feeling about where we are now is always so influenced by my experience of where we were not so long ago. Um, I'll never forget those days in the Department of Finance and in our government when we were uh, confronting the risk of 600,000 people becoming unemployed over a number of days because we were going to ask their employers to close down and then not to go to work. Uh, I'll never forget those moments and the challenges regarding how we supported social cohesion, how we supported employers, how we supported income. Those moments then in December and January when we were confronting the third wave and the impact that was having on our country, the loss of life, those moments we were having six to 7,000 new cases per day when we thousands of people in our hospitals very sick. So to go through those experiences and to be in this battle, a battle between injections and infections, uh, injections of vaccination uh, versus the number of people who are getting sick each day, of course, we're in a completely different place now. 13% of the European population having one job. We're going to be, I believe, in a place of over 70% of, of the population across Europe being vaccinated as we approach the summer. The immense success uh, that is the Irish vaccination program that is being delivered uh, by our frontline workers, by our healthcare professionals, uh, despite all the challenges it faced, despite all the criticism and issues that were raising, raised, it's vaccinating at scale. And that's making a massive difference. And of course, I feel very different to where we are now. Uh, but the challenges we have coming up are great. The complexity of them will be very deep and they will change rapidly. And we have a lot to do to change an early rebound into a recovery that is real. We have a lot to do. Uh, and uh, I'm always very optimistic about any challenge, uh, but I'm also very realistic in appraising the nature of the one that we're now in the early phase of. Uh, but I did a debate, Francis, a few weeks, a few months ago, uh, when I'm um, not a debate, uh, it was actually an interview. I found myself unwittingly cast into your shoes and having to chair an event like this, which was a whole new skill I had to learn. Uh, an event that was being organised by Dublin City Council uh, about city libraries. And I was attempting to interview Anne Applebaum, which was a deeply humbling experience. Uh, given her enormous uh, uh, prowess and all she has done. And in response to a question from the audience, she said, pessimism is irresponsible. Um, and I thought it was a, a useful piece of advice to me, uh, despite my optimistic nature, um, or maybe because of it, about how we need to approach what is yet to come. Uh, but we have real challenges, but they are different to where we were a year ago. So in the nature of that recovery and, and bringing all things a bit together, I'd just like to take a final question to you both uh, relating to the environment within a number of those in along the way. And it's Martha O'Hagan Luff from Trinity College. Could the speakers comment on the urgency of making environmental sustainability front and centre of the expected recovery? Now, I know both of you have commented on this in Philip as recently, I think, as yesterday, but I just wanted to make a brief comment on that. Uh, you know, as part of this positive recovery out of the rebound. So do you want to start? So, I mean, regardless of the pandemic, we, we had key calendar dates, you know, 2030, 2050. So we knew already uh, that there was going to be a major transition underway um, uh, over the coming years. So the transition to uh, towards net zero it is just pervasive. It pervades uh, corporate life. It will be uh, for many families and households. Of course, there would be changes in, in behavior in terms of transportation, uh, retrofitting homes and so on. So yes, this, this is, uh, and I, you know, the, from an economic point of view, there are two issues. One is um, 
the nature of a transition, like I, I mentioned earlier on, is always going to be difficult because you do have to reallocate. Uh, you do have to accept that some sectors are going to shrink. And that the value of some types of assets will, will, will go down, are going down and will go down. On the other hand, there will be opportunities. It, it is, you know, I think clear cut, and it, it's reinforced in the nature of the next generation EU. A lot of activity will be generated by, by this transition. Uh, there's a heavy focus, uh, and it's a huge potential payoff to RD in terms of uh, the technology that will support that. So, so that engine for, for the world economy and the European economy. I, I do think it's net positive. It will it will help to to kind of provide a focus and momentum for the recovery, uh, without wanting to to downgrade the difficulties for you know many individuals uh, and many firms. So the ECB is fully committed to being a green central bank, uh, and in terms of you know for me as the chief economist, understanding the implications for economic performance both over the business cycle and the trend. Uh, understand the implications um, for, for our monetary policy, for, for the instruments we use. Uh, we have a big agenda, but of course, uh, this is only one element of the agenda uh, for, for governments, for the private sector, uh, and the, the Dublin Climate Dialogues the last few days just illustrated that there's a lot of people working on this. Uh, it, it really is, I, I think, arriving at a kind of a tipping point where there's been a lot of talk for decades, honestly. I mean, the, there's been a lot of work, uh, economic research has been there for 50 years about many of these issues, uh, but you need to get your timing uh, right, and we have no time uh, really to delay. Uh, we, we have fixed uh, uh, commitments, and when you are now in a nine years away from 2030, it's clear a, a lot has to happen. Minister, final word from you. That this debate is now moving into law, the Climate Action Bill that is in the Oireachtas that Minister Vaid has introduced, looking to anchor our commitments for 2030 and then for 2050 into law in Ireland, looking to implement and bring in five-year carbon budgeting. Uh, if I look at where we are within uh, our European discussions, when I joined Eurogroup, our ECOFIN, climate made an occasional appearance in our agenda. It's now a regular item on our agenda. If I look at the focus that we have with regard to green finance, for example, the debate that's underway in relation to taxonomy, um, if I look at what we've done here in Ireland, uh, uh, you know, uh, everybody who's not in government votes against these changes. Um, automatic increases in carbon pricing, complete overhaul of where we are now with our motor taxi taxation system and VRT to now mainstream environmental. Uh, uh, concerns regarding vehicles. Uh, this is now all happening. Uh, and um, a, a concern I had a year ago, uh, but in the context then of the deepest challenges of a year ago, is this would be a debate that would be relegated for a while, given the acute emergency we face then. That hasn't happened. Um, it's not to uh, underestimate how much we need to do. Um, uh, but if, but my, my really has to focus now, and that focus, focus is growing by the day. Listen, could I thank both of you for contributing today? I think it's a mark of the important role that the IIEA has played in contributing to understanding European issues and European policy issues over the last 30 years. I'm sure that the late Brendan Halligan would have been delighted with your engagement today. It's very much a concentration, notwithstanding a bit of tax on the side, uh, a concentration on the European issues and the European, European agenda, uh, but also the way in which the IAEA team has organized this anniversary celebration, which is obviously centered on, on its mission of sharing ideas and shaping policy. So this is a perfect panel discussion from that point of view. Um, on behalf of the IE, I want to thank the, you, the audience, for your presentation, uh, presence today and your engagement. And apologies that we couldn't get to all of the questions but I tried to pick up the themes and some of the ones that, uh, that we did get to ask. When I was young, um, it was tradition when you left a birthday celebration to leave with a gift. And in today's virtual world, I want to give a gift to all of you in the form of a reading and a watching recommendation. So the reading recommendation is Professor Lane's paper, The Resilience of the Euro, which is published this quarter in the Journal of Economic Perspectives. I wouldn't be surprised with Minister Dunn, who has already read it, but we'll, we'll, uh, if he hasn't, I'm sure he will soon. I think the coverage of what are very complex issues is, is, is very 
considerable and the clarity of the exposition is is, is exceptional from, from a perspective I think of giving a big picture of Europe all the institutions are there all the all of the all of the, the the complex issues are there but it sets it out very clearly so my watching listening recommendation and I say watching because you can watch it but you could also listen to it if you didn't want to watch it um, is Minister Dunn who's com um, conversation with Marcus Brunmeier uh, on the Princeton University website a week ago today on the 13th of May uh, it's a tour de force to watch and to listen, and you can just listen to it because we get visuals, but the visuals aren't important. And um, to see an experienced politician who's committed to policy that's evidenced, grounded in evidence, engaging with an economist who's contributed so much uh, in economics to what is relevant to policy. So they're my two takeaways for everyone in the audience. And thank you both again very much. And thank you to the IAA for organizing this event. Goodbye. Thank you.